I can remember the exact day when my world changed from small and insignificant to meaningful and full of promise. It was the day when, to my great surprise, a student asked me for help. It's summertime in Arkansas. I'm surrounded by giant rice fields. It's actually known as the rice capital of the United States. But for those of us who live there, we call it the mosquito capital of the United States. <laughs> it's pretty isolated. I'm sitting in the computer lab of the engineering building up on campus, and I'm writing some code. And the guy next to me leans over, and he says, hey, you look like you know how to do this stuff. I'm really stuck. Can you help me out? Sure. Uh, uh, it looks like you need to put a parenthesis there to close off your loop. Oh, and you got to declare your two variables right up there at the top. Ah, got it. Thanks a lot, man. Whole interaction took maybe a minute. I was 10. <laughs> and this guy was literally twice my age, a college engineering student. And you have to understand, I'm wearing hand-me-down t-shirt and shorts, my tube socks are flopping around my ankles because my brother stretched them out. <laughs> I'm still perspiring from riding my three-speed bike up the hill to get to campus. And what amazes me, even today, is not how unnatural or out of place it was to have that interaction with him, but how entirely natural and normal it felt. For the first time in my life, technology had erased my social and economic disadvantages. The way I looked, the way I talked, where I came from was irrelevant. I was on equal footing for what I knew and what I could do. It felt exactly like having superpowers. And it wasn't because I was some sort of child prodigy. I honestly believe that anybody could have been in that seat. For me, it was pure happenstance. My friend's dad, had access to the computer lab, and it was just more interesting to learn how to code than to sit at home and watch daytime television all summer. No one intended to give me powerful tools and running room to play with them. I'm so grateful that somebody did. And I want every child to have that same opportunity that I did. We talk a lot about the digital divide. It's the divide between those who have access to technology and those who don't. But there's another divide that's equally urgent. It's the digital use divide. It's the divide between those students who have the opportunity to use powerful tools to create, to collaborate, to explore, to solve, and those who are simply given a screen to watch and to listen. We have more than two decades of research that tell us that this is a problem across the board but it's worse for our historically disadvantaged students. I've been to schools where little kids are wearing little headphones and they're asleep in front of their screens. It doesn't have to be this way, and you and I can change it. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is Shay. At the time, she was 15 years old and living in rural West Virginia where coal mining had defined a way of life for generations. And that world was collapsing all around her. Her state leaders thought it was a good idea to wire her rural school with fiber optic cable. And her teachers thought it was a good idea to give Shea the same powerful tools that scientists use to collect and analyze reams of data from giant radio telescopes pointed at deep space. They were right. It was a good idea. Shea discovered a star, a neutron star. She's 15 years old. Martian is the son of first generation immigrants. He's also legally blind. Martian's teacher thought it would be a good idea to give Martian the same tools that engineers use to create digital designs for manufacturing. They were right. Martian designed a car. It gets 100 miles to the gallon, it's fuel efficient, and they actually built it. Now, you may be saying to yourself, 
we are not going to be in the shoes of Martian and in the shoes of Shea anytime soon in my school. We're not going to be discovering stars. We're not going to be designing cars. And I get that. But we can start right where we are. Let me tell you a little more about my story. I moved from rural Arkansas to rural Kansas. It was even more isolated. <laughs> my middle school was built in 1939. It didn't have any air conditioning. And down in the basement, it had these bomb shelters in case of a nuclear apocalypse. <laughs> and I signed up for a shop class. It sounded cool. And the guys in the shop class next to me were learning how to build sheds, which is useful and interesting. My shop teachers decided that we were going to learn how to program robots. So we did. A little later on, I joined a scout troop. While other scout troops learned how to camp and tie knots, which is useful and interesting, my scout troop learned how to design circuit boards. And did you notice it didn't take a new organization or a new building or even air conditioning? to make this happen, it did take an adult with vision and passion and a willingness to take a risk on something new. The long-term impacts of this approach can be phenomenal. For me, it led to another day, which I will never forget, when, to my great surprise, I was asked, on behalf of the President of the United States, and the Secretary of Education to move to Washington, D.C. and take on the responsibility of making these kinds of experiences available for every child in this country. It's a long ways from that computer lab in Arkansas. So what do we learn from Shay, from Martian, from my 10-year-old self? It's not enough to give them the connectivity and the smartphones we need to give them tools, not just screens. We need to trust them. We need to give them a running room. We need to give them a chance to turn the screen around and create something that makes us want to watch and listen and learn from them. And I promise you, if we do this, no one's going to be paying any attention to what they look like or where they came from. Their hand-me-down clothes and sagging tube socks aren't going to matter. Until we do this, we're really not going to know what they're capable of. And even more importantly, neither will they. Thank you. <laughs>